Malcolm, welcome back to Edinburgh. Thank you very much. You, you brought some very sunny weather with you, and we're meeting here in uh, Walter Scott's offices the day after your uh, talk at the University of Edinburgh yesterday, which was greatly appreciated. Thank you. On the subject of China, which I want to talk to you about, amongst other things, for a bit. But I also would like to just welcome you on behalf of the Asia Scotland Institute, which we set up um, about six years ago now, with a core mission to educate and inspire tomorrow's leaders in Scotland to re-engage with Asia, part of the world with which mm -hmm. the Scots, as we both know, had many, many contacts. And I perhaps start off by asking you whether you think that's a good mission and whether it's a good thing to work to improve people's understanding of Asia. It's the easiest possible question to answer because <laughs> uh, the reasons why what you're doing is hugely important is not just because of the historical background, not just because what Scots have done in the past, all of which is true, mm. but because Asia, as we can see almost every week and every month and every year, is becoming more and more important for, to the world as a whole. It's an extraordinary success story as a continent. And uh, the more that the United Kingdom in general, Scotland in particular, have close ongoing relationships with all the countries of Asia, but some obviously more than others that are particularly important, uh, that's good for us all. Yeah. When we spoke uh, together yesterday, um, I noted, we pointed out that uh, you held ministerial appointments for 18 consecutive years, which is something of a record, not seen by anybody except Lord Palmerston. Well, I, it was not just me. There were a total of four of us, uh, right. Ken Clark and yes. one or two others, yes. who did this. We were appointed the first day of Margaret Thatcher, yep. and uh, for some reason neither she nor John Major sacked us right. for the intervening 18 years. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it shouldn't happen that long mm -hmm. in a democracy, but uh, we kept winning in general elections. Very good. And that's, uh, one of but the what it meant, which it has meant, and certainly this was the perception of people uh, at the Playfair Library yesterday, is that you've got a, you, you have had a scope and a breadth of vision of what's been going on, which to many people appears to be somewhat lacking at the moment amongst those in some of these key ministerial positions. Well, in my, in my own particular case, I mean, I, my interest in politics originally was uh, international yes. issues rather than domestic ones. And after Edinburgh University, I spent two years in what is now Zimbabwe, it was in yes. southern Rhodesia. Yes. And I've kept myself informed throughout, and I was fortunate enough, uh, of the 18 years that you mentioned, um, a total, both as Foreign Secretary and as a junior minister, a total of some uh, six years were in the Foreign Office, and also another three and a half years in the Ministry of Defence. Mm, uh, so yes. altogether, about 10 years. Yeah dealing as a minister with the sort of issues that uh, Britain has to cope with. One of, the, one of the things that you and I have spoken about is the, the fact that it's difficult with the Brexit preoccupation, if that's the right word, for the Foreign Office to demonstrate that it's got the bandwidth, or the government, the bandwidth to deal with some very pressing issues. We'll come to China in a second, but there are clearly in Myanmar, Burma, Russia, um, and elsewhere in the world, a lot of things with which normally... Yes. Great Britain would be, I suppose, engaged and able to exercise an influence. Well, I think the Foreign Office is engaged. They, certainly they would say they were engaged in all these yes, issues. Yes. But, of course, the reality is that if you have a limited amount of manpower, yep. and if Brexit, for understandable reasons, mm -hmm. being the single biggest issue the UK has to resolve, uh, then your more senior, most able diplomats yes. tend to be focused on these issues. Yes. So the people dealing with other parts of the world may be perfectly good, but at a much earlier part of their career, yeah. less experienced and with, with less authority. Mm -hmm. There's also a wider issue that doesn't just affect the United Kingdom. Um, countries like France, like Britain, like the, uh, Germany and so forth, uh, their diplomatic service, their foreign ministries, uh, only use a fraction of public expenditure. Yes. But nevertheless, what they do have available is almost all on manpower. Yeah. Uh, so if the resources being provided for you aren't as much as you think you ought to have, uh, then it's difficult to man the embassies yeah. to do the diplomatic work which does require manpower intensive skills. Mm -hmm. perhaps, perhaps before we turn to China, given your time spent as uh, Minister of Defence, the, the whole Novichok, Russia uh, thing, the aggressive nature of their, their cyber attacks uh, is something that is very much in the newspapers at the moment. What is the best way, do you think, for the United Kingdom to handle that? Well, I, the people who are responsible for Novichok and for some of the other events are called the GRU. They are the military intelligence yes. arm, but actually they're not just military. Uh, they are used by Putin mm. uh, as the single most important uh, way in which he develops his overseas cyber yes. uh, interference and does a serious amount of damage. Now, what uh, both the Salisbury affair and other recent uh, 
revelations of GRU attempts to hack and so forth, what they've shown is they're not very competent. No. Uh, they've been very interfering in not just the United Kingdom with the terrible events in Salisbury, but across a whole swathe of Western countries. And when you recall, when we decided to expel some of the so-called diplomats mm. after the Salisbury poisoning, to our own surprise, and certainly to Mr. Putin's surprise, 27 other countries, mm. not all of which were NATO members, mm. joined us in solidarity in expelling uh, people, Russians, from their own uh, embassies. And they did that not just to be kind to the United Kingdom, mm. but because they had all, in different ways, experienced mm. the same sort of interference. Mm. So what Russia is doing, what Putin has to eventually acknowledge, is how much he enjoys these sort of, uh, or orchestrating these activities. He is virtually destroying, over a period of months, uh, the reputation of his own government and indirectly of his own country. Yes. Now, his government deserves to have its reputation tarnished. Yes. His country doesn't. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, that's unfair, uh, unfair for Russia as a great country and a marvellous country. But they've got a chap in charge now in the Kremlin uh, who is inadequate to the kind of responsibility. He, he throws his weight around. He, he's not going to start massive wars. He's not no. a Hitler going to start a world war. No. But he's opportunistic. Yes. And he thinks that using intelligence issues and little green men in Ukraine, cyber attacks and all the sorts of things, he thinks it's very smart. And it's oh, now all being demonstrated, mm. not only to be not smart and not decent, but also actually hugely unsuccessful. Is this why Trump admires him? Well, they have certain things in common. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Trump's admiration is not because people like Putin or uh, other uh, authoritarian leaders, it's not because they aren't democracies. He doesn't think of it in those terms. Yeah. He just assumes that just when you're running a company, you can have your way. Yeah. So too, if you become president of a country, you should be able to issue instructions and everyone obeys them. But life's not and Putin, well, But Putin does do that. Yes. Xi Jinping in China does that. Yes. Poor Mr. Trump discovers that the Supreme Court tells him he's breaking the law and he yeah. can't. No. They can't do it, and, and if it's not the Supreme Court, it's Congress. Yes, yes. Uh, and that is deeply disturbing to someone of his temperament. Yeah. Let's turn to China, which is what you came here yes. and talked about so well yesterday. Um, and I remember the sort of the principal themes of, of, of your of the case that you put and posited. G give us your 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 view of, of China and both the internal and the external forces at work work here. Well, the most important thing I think people would should want to realise is that the extraordinary growth and importance that we, with which China yeah. now has developed is not some historic aberration. No. The aberration was they ever ceased to be a great country for 100 years, mm. mainly because of foreign interference from Japan and indeed in the 19th century from countries like Britain and others. So they went through a period which was an aberration of their history. Yes. They're now coming back into the sort of position, a huge country of over a billion people and with such a long and magnificent culture and history of 2,000 years, they should be one of the great powers of the world, and that's now what's happening. So that's okay. But that still opens up the question, what do they do with the power? Yes. And is it going to be legitimate uh, use of that power, or is it going to be throwing your weight around in a rather unpleasant way that will destabilize uh, not just Western interests, but the interests of all the countries of their own region? And what has happened is, uh, since uh, Deng Xiaoping departed, and particularly since Xi Jinping arrived, they are throwing their weight around. You know, yes. They deny it, they say they are trying to be friends to everyone and not interfering with anyone, but the reality is, if you look at what they're doing in the South China Sea, Absolutely. it's a very hotly contested area with various claims by half a dozen countries, mm -hmm. and they're just saying, too bad, we're in charge, go away, and, and ignoring international arbitration mm -hmm. and any other way of resolving the matters peacefully. So that's, that's pretty damaging. They're also incredibly and unnecessarily oversensitive. Indeed. Uh, wh what we have seen, and we've seen this in, in the United Kingdom, in our universities and some companies, if British Airways or some airline, wasn't British Airways or some other airline, uh, when mentioning flights to Taiwan, doesn't mention it's part of China. Yes. You know, they get punished. Yes. You know, if um, uh, someone like you or me uh, talks in, uh, about the Dalai Lama, yeah. or the absence of human rights in Xinjiang or in Tibet. Mm -hmm. uh, they take umbrage yes. and so forth. Now, you can, what that's ultimately showing is a remarkable lack of self-confidence. Absolutely. Because if they think that what they're doing is right and legitimate, then they should argue their case, like we all have to do. Absolutely. We all sometimes involve ourselves in issues that the rest of the world 
thinks we're on the wrong side of the, the line. Yeah. Uh, and we don't try and react the way they do. So far from being an expression of their strength when they interfere and bully people, ultimately, actually, even when they succeed, it's an admission of ultimate weakness, mm. that they feel the need to do that. Mm. And a country as large, as important, as significant as China mm. should should just be able to brush off. Mm. We talked matter. about the, the whole Belt and Road uh, project that they have, which is amazing. It reaches all the way up to Rotterdam. And indeed, there was a time when there was a project to do something in Scotland, which didn't get off the starting blocks, but that was discussed. And that sort of projection of, of economic power, is, that, is there a military angle to that? Well, first of all, we should be careful. The Chinese, and I don't criticise them for this, but I think we'd do it if it was us, uh, use the term Belt and Road mm. as if it's some carefully orchestrated strategy it's not. which has a global significance. It's not. It's, it's hundreds and hundreds of different initiatives, yes. many of which they'd be doing even if there was no, no such thing as Belt and Road. Yes. Uh, they're simply trying, as all countries do, to expand their trade, mm. to build their bilateral relations with other countries, sometimes to lend money or to invest. Yes. And all of that is presented as if it's part of this marvellous, unprecedented strategy. Right. So right. we've got to be a bit careful. But even with the caveats that I've just mentioned, mm. there is at the core of what is called Belt and Road something hugely important, mm. and that is linking China to Europe yes. through the Central Asian landmass. Yes. Since time began, overwhelmingly, apart from uh, Marco Polo and a few brave souls, all the links, and, and especially the trade between Europe and China, or, or in either direction, had to be maritime. Had yes. to go by sea. Yes. Had to be, go either around Africa or through the Suez Canal, and took a long time and so forth. But that's still going to continue for a lot of trade because most of uh, freight is bulk freight, yeah. which is much cheaper to carry, even if it takes longer, mm. by maritime routes. But the Chinese have two reasons why they want to have that central route. First of all, it's quicker yes. uh, for what you can carry by rail, by train, by mm. so forth. But also it enables them to have an alternative way yeah. of getting some of their vital imports. China, for such a large country, is pretty short mm. of some uh, minerals, of, of some of oil and gas, of various other crucial products. And at the moment, if they can't get them through the sea lanes, they don't get them at all. Mm. And this now will give them an alternative way. So there's an, uh, uh, that is geopolitical. Uh, and it's an entirely reasonable yes. uh, objective that they have. You drew a very interesting parallel uh, last night between the, the what's happening in China, but much earlier, the growth of the British Empire. Yes, but, well, in, in what, what I was saying, yes. and in a sense it's happening in reverse, mm. when you look at the way the British Empire developed throughout the 19th century, um, it was mainly about trade. It yes. wasn't some predetermined strategy of the British government to end up with the quarter of the world painted pink. No. It almost happened by accident. But it happened because of the need to, or not the need, the aspiration, the successful aspiration, through the East India Company and yes. similar trading ventures all around the world. And in order to secure trading routes, Britain then acquired various bases. So we had Gibraltar, we had Malta, Aden. we had Aden, uh, we had um, Singapore, we had Hong Kong. And these were important because they were places our ships could stop and yep. get get refueled or have other benefits from. Now that was going from west to east. Yes. What we have seen in the last few years is in a very curious way, I don't want to say it's exactly the same, but there are striking similarities yes. because the Chinese now have, through bilateral relations, they're not, they're not getting territorial sovereignty, no. but they're getting special concessions and special agreements. So they control one of the major ports in Sri Lanka. Yes. Uh, they uh, have a, an agreement with the uh, Pakistanis in Gwadior. Uh, they've got a base in Djibouti in yes. northeast Africa, uh, and so forth. And they're doing it for actually rather similar reasons. Yes. Yes. Why we went the other way. Yes, indeed. My last question to you really has to do with looking at China inward, the, the pressures that they have with the growing middle yes. class and their aspirations, which of course we saw in a sense happening before the collapse of the Soviet Union, because those were not satisfied. Mm. Is that something that they wrestle with? Well, first of all, they, the, the people often pay the Chinese huge credit how they brought 100 million people out of poverty, poverty yeah. and mm -hmm. become middle class and so forth. And all credit to them. Yes, I'm not yes, saying yes. that hasn't been an extraordinary achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, it's, it had happened before in yes. countries like South Korea. Yes. It had happened in Taiwan. Yes. It had happened in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. It happened in Singapore. Um, the reason the world's paying so much more attention is because the statistics 
are so much bigger. It's huge, yeah. You know, when you when you pick up, bring a hundred million into uh, out of poverty uh, from a population of one point three billion, mm. it's not necessarily more successful than doing exactly the same percentage yeah. in Taiwan with yeah. a total population of twenty billion. Yeah. Uh, and it would have happened a lot earlier in China if they hadn't been so silly as to have yes. Mao Zedong and communist uh, economics. Yes. Uh, yes. It was only when Deng Xiaoping got rid of that that they achieved the same as these other Chinese communities in, in the Far East. Uh, they also have a problem, because once people become middle class, they become aspirational. Absolutely. And what we have seen in many parts of the world over hundreds of years is the people who cause revolutions aren't the poorest of the people. They aren't the peasants. They aren't the people who've got nothing. They tend to be unable to use their numbers to achieve social change. It's the middle classes who, if they're being denied what we nowadays call democracy, yeah. but involvement in their political system, they don't like it and they insist on that changing. Their the middle education. classes and the intellectuals. I think. Well, yeah, the intellectuals are not that great in number, but they are very important when it comes to ideas. Yes. But, you know, if you think any month of the year, how many millions of people from the People's Republic of China are now able to afford to go as tourists yeah, well, we see them to, here to, Edinburgh. To, to Edinburgh, to America, to yeah. Western Europe. Yeah. And as soon as they leave China, of course, they can get into Google. Yes. They can find out about their own recent history. Yes. They do find out about Tiananmen Square. Yes. When hundreds of Chinese young students were killed and, yes. and others yes. and, uh, injured and arrested and so forth, which they can never be told about in China itself. Mm. And they ask themselves, this is part of our history, why are we not allowed to know it? Finally, Malcolm, here we are in Scotland. Uh, there were a lot of quite young people at the talk yesterday, students, and yes. postgraduate students. What's your message to, to young people studying here at the beginning young of the Young Chinese day? people? Or young mean, Chinese, but also people from, uh, from Scotland as well. What would your message be to them when talking about this, the century of Asia and engagement in Asia? Well, it's going to be worth making the extra effort to yes. learn about China. Yes. If, we're, if it's China, for example, we're talking about, and that means the much more difficult task of good proportion of them learning the Chinese language. Indeed. You cannot understand a country, and I'm not entitled to say this because I'm very poor in foreign languages, I'm the last person who can uh, advise other people, but the reality is that in most of the world English gets you by, yeah. and it will get you by in China, but yeah. you will not really understand that country as you wouldn't understand any other country yeah. if you aren't able to study its culture and its history and its thought processes, and you have to have a good number of Brits. I mean, interest in learning Chinese has grown yes. significantly yes. in Britain, but it's still tiny mm. in comparison to most other languages. So go forth, visit, learn Mandarin. Go forth and multiply. Well, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> As it were. Malcolm, thank you so much. My pleasure. Lovely to meet you.